Hi. Thank you. Uh, I hope that um, the uh, American participants aren't too jet lagged, but it's uh, my pleasure to be able to start off this meeting um, giving you a background on geomicrobiology of the deep biosphere. As uh, Sonia said, I got the invitation uh, to give this talk while I was floating at sea and then started getting successive emails asking me for documents that I didn't necessarily have access to since they were back on land. Um, but I'm really excited to be here now. Um, so I'll be talking to you basically about microbiology that's happening. Um, I'm, oh, there's the microphone. You can hear me? OK. Um, that's happening uh, largely below the seafloor, um, uh, but also on land. And then uh, Jens and Kelly will talk more about uh, some of the things happening on the land side of things. And so in this uh, introductory slide, you can see a lone microbial cell from probably several hundred meters below the seafloor lit up in green in um, the, the center of that image. And we'll be talking about um, quantifying biomass. So that's one of the ways that uh, we do this. So if I'm going to talk to you about the deep biosphere, I figured I should probably tell you what that actually is. Uh, and so uh, it's uh, somewhat operationally defined, but we like to think about it as starting somewhere between 1 and 10 meters below the seafloor or um, kind of below the oxygenated top layer of soil-ish. Um, and the reason we like to think of it starting there is basically because it's anything too deep to be sampled without specialized equipment. And so um, it's, I won't say easy, but maybe uh, more regular to be able to go out into the field and take, you know, uh, basically a core that's about, you know, a meter long or so, kind of push it into the seafloor um, or, or into soils and, and collect a sample. But if you want to look much deeper than that, you really have to use specialized equipment. And this includes things like uh, gravity cores, which might get you one single 30 meter core, um, or using a drilling ship. Uh, so the current record for a drilling ship um, is going up almost 2,500 meters below the seafloor. And that's all the way through the water column, which can be several hundred to thousands of meters, and then into the seafloor. Uh, so the uh, most common way that we are able to collect these samples is, uh, like I said, using some sort of drilling apparatus. And so in the marine realm, at least, this involves using one of two drilling ships. Um, interest in drilling the seafloor goes back to the mid-60s uh, when scientists first wanted to uh, look at the boundary between the ocean crust and uh, the mantle below that. And that's actually, even though back in the 60s that's what we were trying to do, that's what we're still trying to do. And the cruise that I was on, I was interested in microbiology, but most of the geologists there were interested in drilling basically to the mantle boundary. Uh, and so the tools that we use to do this, one is uh, the Droidus resolution. Is there a pointer? No, that's okay. Um, which is uh, the one at the, uh, the far left. This is uh, an American ship, and we also have uh, the, the Chikyu, um, which is a Japanese ship that's been uh, around for the last 10 years. And so to give you an idea of the scale, the, the Joyce resolution at least is about 450 feet long, uh, which is pretty large for a research vessel. Oh, thank you. Um, and a typical cruise on these. There we go. Joy's resolution. Uh, typical cruise lasts about two months. So you get to go out to sea for two months with 30 of your closest, uh, or well, they will become your closest <laughs> scientific <laughs> colleagues after two months at sea. Um, and one of the exciting things is that you do meet people from different fields. So I was at sea with uh, geologists, some other microbiologists, chemists. Um, and uh, there are really nice lab facilities on these ships, so you can do a lot of science at sea. Um, and a lot of the work is done out there. And then additionally, you'll bring your samples back into your lab and do whatever uh, your special interest is over the next few years following that cruise. So when we do bring these samples up onto the ship, one of the things um, that uh, I, I really like is that they just physically, they, have, they look really cool. And so uh, depending on where you go in the seafloor, it's not this kind of homogenous environment that's just kind of boring mud. Um, but the, there's actually just physically looking at it, you can see different features. And so um, over here, uh, this is a composite image I put together to kind of illustrate that point. And so what it is is uh, pictures of actual sediment cores that were collected off um, on the Peru margin, so off the coast of Peru, um, going from the seafloor, which would be up here, down to 100 meters, a little more than 100 meters below the seafloor. And so just looking at what these uh, sediment cores look like, and they kind of change colors. And you can imagine that as they're changing colors, there's differences in uh, porosity for sure. So there's a lot more space for microbes to move around up here than there is 
down here where it's a lot more compacted. Um, but there's also different chemistry, and so you can imagine different microbial communities kind of living in these uh, different sections. Um, on once you go below the sediments, you actually get into um, the rock, which is kind of uh, my specialty. And down there, things are a little different. And what we look for are these kind of cracks or veins. And this uh, is indication of fluid flow, either presently or, or in the past. And so this is where um, we believe that microbes are likely to exist and moving around in the subsurface. And, and so that's kind of what we look for in terms of where the microbes live. So I'm going to start out telling you a little bit about what we know, kind of the current most exciting um, and up-to-date uh, knowledge about life in marine sediments. Uh, and then I'll talk to you about what's happening uh, below those sediments in rocks. Um, but this is a figure you'll probably see again, um, made by uh, Jens, um, which compiled uh, data over probably the last 30 years. So starting in the mid-'80s is really when this field started. Um, and some of the earliest uh, data that we got back consisted of scientists who went out on these drilling expeditions uh, and collected samples and uh, counted cells, or just enumerated biomass in these samples. And so some of uh, the early data that got us excited was basically that if you look at this plot, which on uh, the y-axis shows you depth below seafloor um, in, in log scale in meters, and so I'll point out zero is actually uh, one meter below seafloor, 10, 100,000 meters below seafloor. And then on the x-axis is uh, cell concentration. Um, so 10 to the 6 cells, 10 to the 7 cells per cubic centimeter, um, or per milliliter is another way you could think about a, a cubic centimeter. And so um, there's a, a few things uh, that we see on this plot. Um, and I'd like to point out two patterns. And so the, the different colored um, circles refer to these different geographic locations. And they kind of indicate specific types of environment. So uh, the easiest way to think about this is that in black, we have near coastal environments, um, which have a lot of organic matter input to the seafloor. So basically, a lot of food is falling down to the seafloor from above to feed the microbes. Um, and then in kind of yellows and blues, um, we're out here, way out in the middle of the ocean. And these are kind of the oceanic deserts. And so there's not a lot of uh, basically primary production in the surface layers. And so not a lot of food falling down into the sediments below. And so two patterns that emerge if you look at this kind of global data, data set. Um, one is that if you just look at one color, so if you just look at the black dots here, um, you always go in a, a log linear fashion from more cells kind of at the seafloor um, to less cells at depth, even though 1,000 meters below seafloor, we, we still see signs of microbial life. Um, there's this kind of linear decrease with depth. Uh, and then the other thing that occurs is depending on where you start. So if you start in a coastal area or if you start way out in the middle of the ocean, you can have orders of magnitude different amounts of biomass. And that will still decrease with depth. But um, this has big implications. If you want to understand kind of globally how much biomass there might be, you have to take into account where your samples came from and kind of extrapolate. Um, and so Jens is a pretty smart guy, so he did that. Um, and one of the uh, really exciting things that came out of this, and this was um, really an update to some earlier work that also indicated there's a lot of biomass down there. Um, but basically, if you add up all of these cells and kind of extrapolate, there's as many microbes living in the sedimentary deep biosphere as there is in the entire marine water column. Um, and so really, if you think that marine microbiology um, or marine microbes are important on any level, which I hope that you do, um, then there's as many of them living below the seafloor in sediments as there are in the water. And so that this is a really important environment uh, to study. And I should say that's just in sediments, so that you, you basically there's more set microbes below the seafloor because there's also microbes in rocks. Um, so to date, our kind of uh, record holder for the deepest microbes that we've been able to uh, recover is uh, at least 2,458 meters below seafloor. Um, I wanted to specifically point out uh, this figure because I, um, uh, Verena Hewer, who's here, has a poster that talks about this expedition and some of the work that they did. Um, but uh, basically, on the left, you have another one of these plots where you have number of cells um, in depth. And you can see here, this goes down to 2,500 meters below seafloor. This was off the coast of Japan. Uh, in this particular cruise, they were specifically interested in looking at what was happening in these deep, deep uh, coal beds, um, trying to understand if there was methane production down there. Um, and some of this isotopic data indicates that there was. 
Um, and so even greater than 2,000 meters below seafloor, we have active microbes and they're, um, and they're making methane and, and doing things that are important um, to global carbon cycling um, and also uh, greenhouse gases. So in one of uh, the kind of paradigm changing notions that's occurred uh, more recently, really in the last five, 10 years, is uh, from kind of the beginnings of studies, what's happening below the seafloor, um, we realized that pretty quickly usually, especially close to the shore, you run out of oxygen. And so the assumption was that if you go into these environments, um, there's this oxygen may be very close to the, the surface, um, but as you get deeper that you, you run out of oxygen and you start having other metabolic processes. Um, and this is one of the reasons why if you ever go to a marsh, it smells like rotten eggs, right? Because that's sulfate reducers that live in, in those environments releasing sulfide into the environment. Um, well, more recent work which has said, hey, maybe we shouldn't focus so much on all these sites that are really close to land and easier to access, uh, but we should go way out into the middle of the ocean which, if you look at a map of the world, represents most of the ocean. Um, we should probably figure out what's happening out there, right? Uh, and so uh, this is these um, series of dots. This is uh, the results of one of these drilling cruises that went out for two months um, and went around the South Pacific Gyre collecting samples. And what they found, um, if you look at this plot, this is they did find cells all the way down to the bottom of the sediments. So for each of these different colors, this represents one of these different sites, and they basically went as far as they could before they hit rocks. Um, but the other thing that they found was at all of these sites, except this one black site that was, uh, or I should say site, the black dot, um, that was kind of outside of the oceanic gyre and was kind of a control site. So for all of these sites within this big ocean desert or ocean gyre, um, there was oxygen all the way down to the seafloor. And so this really changes our understanding of what's happening out in, in the open ocean sites. Um, and if you look at this map, all of the um, areas of the ocean that are kind of these darker colors represent that type of site. And so about 40% of the ocean floor, we think, um, actually has oxygen all the way down to basement, which is really a complete change in, in what we know about uh, the seafloor um, just in the last few years. So I know you guys are probably saying, well, that's pretty interesting, but Jason, what about microbes in sub C4 volcanic basement, right? <laughs> um, so in, I should say, so to, to reduce uh, jargon, when, um, basement uh, just refers to basically the rocks kind of that make up the seafloor below the sediments. So I'll say that a lot. I kind of, I don't know how many people actually know what I'm talking about when I say that. So let me, <laughs> I'll clear that up ahead of time. But so, Sediments, um, you know, are overlying kind of the rocks that make up the seafloor that uh, form at uh, seafloor mid-ocean spreading ridges. Um, and one of the reasons that we're interested in what's happening in those rocks below the seafloor um, is that there's water moving through them. And so at any one time, about 2% of the volume of the ocean is moving through this sub-seafloor um, aquifer. And um, over the oops, wow, that was awesome. I did that last night also. Almost got wine all over. Um, okay, uh, so at any one time, there's about two percent of the volume in the ocean is moving through this aquifer, and over geological timescales, about every two hundred thousand years, the entire ocean cycles um, through the subseafloor aquifer. Um, therefore, it's important if um, you will really want to understand global carbon budgets and um, chemistry and, and what's happening um, to microbiology down there. Another reason it's interesting is we don't know very much about it. We know that it's this massive global substrate. Um, if you look, this is a, a plot of all of the places that one of those two drilling ships has taken samples over the last 50 years. Um, and this is a plot of all of the places that basement microbiology has actually been studied. So this is only, there's only nine stars on there. There's not a lot of uh, places. So basically, there's nine pinpricks in the ocean where we know anything about the microbiology that's happening in these rocks. Um, and I would go further to say that really these four sites are the only ones where people have used kind of modern microbial techniques and really dealt with contamination controls, um, and, and specifically the one off the west coast of um, the U.S. and the two out in the middle of the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. Those are, those are sites where a lot of work has been going on, and we, we think we're getting a better idea of what's going on. And so um, this one site way out here in the Indian Ocean, this is where I was when I got the invitation to come here, and so we'll start to find out um, more about that, but um, things are still underway. Uh, one of the other exciting things about um, 
this type of work is that you can actually make observatories and, and um, therefore make experiments and come back and kind of repeatedly visit the same sites. And so after you drill, you've basically left a hole in the seafloor and you could go back and kind of uh, uh, put a seal on the top, we call that a cork, um, which prevents seawater from intruding into the aquifer below. And you could go back and over the course of years do experiments, you could incubate things in, in the borehole, um, or you could just take time series and see what, what happens, you know, every time we come back, do we see the same types of communities, the same chemistry, or does that change? Um, and so this is one example of that. Um, does that mean I have one minute or I'm done? I have one minute, okay. Uh, so in, in, uh, in this particular case, um, you would just, um, what they're showing here is in the, the kind of the, the reds and the oranges, they're showing that microbes that are actually coming from the crust from good clean samples are very different from ones that are in the sediments above or the seawater that's kind of in, in the background samples. And so these are unique environments um, with uh, active communities. Um, here, using a series of these kind of um, uh, observatories, uh, the authors found that if you look at microbial activity, both primary producers and um, heterotrophs, um, in background seawater versus in the subsea floor uh, community, that the subsea floor community is actually more active in this particular site, this one pinprick in the ocean, um, than it is in the background seawater. And that's uh, potentially a really big deal for understanding um, metabolism in this environment. So, um, and even though we're microbiologists, we like our charismatic macrofauna. Uh, and so every time you go and you visit one of these observatories, there's a nice little octopus waiting for you, kind of guarding it, um, <laughs> keeping a lookout. Uh, so, and I'll uh, finish off um, with uh, some of my own data, um, which was collected uh, kind of northeast of uh, New Zealand, looking at a series of inactive seamounts. Um, but this, one of the big questions I had is, we really didn't have a good handle on what the biomass was down in that system. And so I wanted to understand what is the biomass and contrast it to what we know about sedimentary systems. Um, and so two things came out of this that I think are really exciting. So one is if you look at just the, the sheer number, and so this is uh, the same axes. We have numbers of cells um, and depth below seafloor. We have a few different sites. This dotted line indicates kind of my um, limit of quantification, and so things that are to the left of that um, are quantifiable but not statistically different from background. So I would say they're below detection. Um, so if you look at the numbers, uh, it goes up to about 10 to the fourth cells per cubic centimeter. This circled box is the same area on the sedimentary plot. And so these are very low biomass um, environments, basically as low as the lowest ones we see in sediments. Uh, the other thing is that if you look at just any one color, you can see kind of as you go deeper, it bounces back and forth between some below detection and some above detection, um, as opposed to kind of a straight line as you get deeper. And this just indicates that there are fundamental differences in what controls biomass in the rock that's underlying the sediments that are right above it. And so they're, they're, they're both really cool environments and they're fundamentally different and um, interesting and important to study. And so um, I will uh, leave it there and um, put up some acknowledgments. Uh, I do want to point out my uh, postdoctoral advisor who actually got me into deep biosphere research. Um, and I'll, I guess, is, is Jens or Kelly up next? Yes, so I'll, I'll pass it off to Jens Kalmar. <laughs>